we'll briefly spend a little bit of time on the road to Emmaus. But uh, I'm excited to be able to look really at three themes quickly. The first one is hope. I believe that we live in a very, very challenging world, and things are confusing to the church. And I think we need hope desperately. And so I'd like to speak briefly about that. I want to talk a little bit about what I would call worldview, or is also called imaginative vision. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then I would hope to get to, if we've got the time, a really simple solution to restore hope called the little way. And so I'm looking forward to that. Well, let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would send us your Holy Spirit now at this moment, but Lord, throughout our entire lives, that you would transform not just our hearts, but our minds, that we would see what you see, that we would love what you love. The world pushes us to think about things, everything differently from you. But you, through the power of your spirit, can transform us into your image. Be with us, Lord. We love you. And we entrust ourselves to you through the mother you've given us as we pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about hope. Hope is a very interesting virtue, and like the other virtues, we're taught by St. Thomas Aquinas and others, that the virtues are actually opposed by vices in a very unique way. There's actually two vices that oppose every virtue. One of them is the exact opposite of the virtue. So for hope, the opposite would be despair. But the other vice that attacks is a counterfeit. It's a shallow, uh, pretend version. And the pretend version, the counterfeit for hope, is presumption. And so I want to talk to you about how we need to avoid presumption because it's going to, it'll paralyze us, and how we need to avoid despair because it also paralyzes us. We have to be able to act with hope. And hope is different than optimism. Optimism is the whimsical desire, the wish, if you will, that things will get better. And I stand before you tonight, brothers and sisters, I am not an optimist. I do not have a whimsical view that things are going to get better, but I am here tonight with you filled with hope. Hope says, if we fall to our knees, if we draw close to the scriptures, if we immerse ourselves in the sacraments, if we work our tails off, if and only if we're immersed in prayer and in the sacraments, because grace is everything, and then we work and we suffer, God will bless that, and we could see things change for the better in dramatic ways. Hope is amazing. It's this wonderful virtue. It's poured into us at baptism and strengthened in confirmation in, every, in all of the sacraments to be able to see the power of this great virtue. It's interesting to see that St. John Paul II sometimes is referred to as an apostle of hope. His, his, auto, or his biography, Witness to Hope, he wrote on the threshold of hope. He, to, he spoke a lot about because I think he saw the same thing, that there, there are challenges with us and there are challenges on the horizon that will require us to have the virtue of hope and not mere optimism. I want to give you a, an example of presumption and how I think sometimes Catholics have a, a faulty or an incomplete view of a biblical passage which we all know very, very well, and that we need to understand that it can lead us to presumption. We know it well in Matthew 16, verse 18. Jesus says, I will, upon you, Peter, I will found my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I think this, if we're not, care, if we're not careful, can lead us to presumption. I've heard people say things like this. Well, we're going to win in the end. Right? And, and, that, and that's true. But here's, this is where the presumption comes in. The margin of victory is very much up for grabs. We're going to win. But really, the margin of victory is everything. There are billion, B, billions of people on earth today who do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And if we don't go and get them, they may die without ever having known him, ever having known to call out for, for his mercy. But if we were to pray and immerse ourselves in the sacraments and the scriptures, and we were to go in hope, then we could reach them and they might live forever with God. We can't presume because the margin of victory is everything. Many of you have family members and loved ones who are in a questionable place with the Lord right now. 
We want to be filled with hope and then to act. We'll talk a little bit more about how to act. I want to talk to you about despair. And I'll give you an example. I, just a couple weeks ago, I, I got back from Greece. I, I took my wife to Greece, a, a pilgrimage. The pilgrimage was the footsteps of St. Paul. A, and it was beautiful. We had 50 Catholic families, a, a bishop and about five priests on a four-mass sailing ship. It was unbelievable. Mass and holy hour every day. Great pilgrimage sites. And then also a happy hour every evening. The... the uh, the people who invited us say, you need to understand, Curtis, if you're going to come, when you pray, you're going to have to pray hard. And when you play, you're going to have to play hard. And Mike Land and I looked at each other and said, we can do that. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was amazing. And uh, probably the highlight of the trip was uh, the day we were in Patmos. Patmos is where St. John the Apostle was exiled and where he received the book of Revelation in a vision and dictated it to one of his young disciples. And the cave is there. And it's, a, it's an amazing situation. You're there, and you're, it's amazing. A large Orthodox uh, monastery above the cave, and we're down in the cave, and this is the place. They're, they're just 100% sure. And uh, it's, it's just amazing to be there. There's a little notch where St. John would have been able to put his head. And as you look out from the cave on a clear day, you can see Ephesus. Ephesus is where he had been exiled from. He, you may remember that he brought the Blessed Virgin Mary there after the persecutions in the Holy Land increased he brought Mary to Ephesus. Ephesus was one of the largest cities in the world, but it was neither Jerusalem nor Rome, which were dangerous places for Christians. So Ephesus was relatively calm. Later, St. Paul would come and live there and write a famous letter to the Ephesians. And uh, so we were there, and it was just, it was spectacular. And uh, great day of prayer. The next day, we sailed to Turkey. It was our one day in Turkey. And we went to Ephesus, and um, Ephesus is devastating. It's literally devastated. It's in ruins. And I want to read to you just a quick passage from the very letter of Revelation to the church at Ephesus. They're told in Revelation 2, verse 2, I know the deeds and your toil and perseverance that you cannot endure evil men, and you put to test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. All positive compliments. Now the challenge. And you have perseverance, and you have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary, but I have this against you. You have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds at first, that you did at first, or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand. The image there of removing a lampstand is I will remove the church, a church founded by Paul and John and Mary, a church that was flourishing, that received a beautiful, beautiful letter from St. Paul. It has been illegal to be a, a Christian in Ephesus for centuries. The lampstand's gone. In fact, when we were there, we spent the day in Ephesus, and I, I, I found myself devastated. I said, we came here to pay money to see what non-Christians broke. It's all gone. And, and you, you go, and, and the Council of Ephesus was held there. The first Marian dogma, that Mary is the, the God-bearer, the Theotokos, was, was, was declared there. And as is the case with Marian dogmas, they're really about Jesus, that Jesus is one person, and we don't, our natures don't have moms, our, as persons we have moms. And so Jesus' two natures, human and divine, united in his divine will, divine personhood, had a mother and a father, and Mary's the mother of God. And it's kind of cool, the, the people outside were chanting about Mary being the mother of God. The bishops inside were thinking, I think they're, they're praying and trying to figure out, and the people are chanting, and it hit me while I was there. Of course they're chanting. Their great-great-grandparents knew her. Oh my goodness, it's so real. But the place where the Council of Ephesus took place is in ruins. And then we went to the other side of town to the Basilica of St. John, which is in ruins. And we were traveling with a guy who's kind of a character. And um, he knows how to get things done, if you know what I mean. He went to the Turkish government and saw, went, said, could we have mass on the ruins of St. John's Basilica? 
And they said, we don't know, we don't do that. And he said, are, are you sure? And so uh, Bishop Toops, who we were with, the wonderful bishop from Beaumont, Texas, said mass on the ruins of St. John's Basilica. When we first started to talk to the local tour guides, they said, uh, there hasn't been a mass here in over a decade. And then we talked to some others, there hasn't been a mass here in over 25 years. And as we dug a little bit more, it may have been hundreds of years. The Apostle John's tomb is there. It was moved from the ruins of Ephesus to where the basilica was, and then was later destroyed. The church is gone, but it doesn't stop there. There's six other churches in the book of Revelation who will get warnings for various things, and all seven of those churches are no longer, they have no Catholic presence at all. No Catholic presence at all. In fact, if you look at the New Testament, and you look at the letters written to the cities, Rome, Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, Thessalonica. Rome is the only city that still has a, a, a majority Catholic presence. All of those churches are gone. They're either dominated by Muslims, or in some cases like Corinth, there's a, a strong Orthodox presence, but Rome's presence is not there. And I, I left Ephesus at the sense that we lost. We got trounced. And I, and I found myself being angry that, that, that this had been destroyed. And I thought, this is not the attitude that Paul had when he came here. He loved these people with the love of Jesus Christ. And he wanted better for them. And I remember sitting, I said, Bishop, can I talk to you at lunch? And Bishop Toops and I had lunch. And I said, I've been doing evangelization for 25 years. I don't even know of anybody who's actually talking about sending Catholics back to Ephesus or to Smyrna or any of these places to win them back to Christ and to the fullness of faith in the Catholic Church. We have to, I'm not saying that focus should do that, but I'd like to encourage people to. I don't know what God's calling us to do, but I found myself despairing for a couple of hours and then realized like, you can't live in despair. We have to pray. We have to dive deeply into the sacraments. And then we have to act with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so that's, that's hope. And I'm very grateful that we have an, uh, an opportunity to do this. And I'm here to tell you what I'm going to share with you works. Uh, it, it works. We didn't invent it. Um, we just stole it from Jesus, it, and it works. But there's some really simple stuff that we as Catholics can do. Uh, and I want to talk about that. But before I, I do, I want to take one step also onto the issue of worldview or imaginative vision. Because I believe if we don't understand this, we can't provide a solution. And I would say things have gotten so bad that if we don't understand this, we can't make headway. We can't make headway. Now, what do I mean by worldview? Well, my good friend Ted Sri was talking to some of our leaders the other day. Ted's got glasses, and he said, you know, a worldview is kind of, it's not what you see, it's the lens through which you see. And, and it's developed over time. You're sometimes, we're frequently not aware of what it is, but lots of different influences form the way we look at things. And, and then Ted said, my eyesight is so bad that when I take off my glasses, I can't tell if you're a boy or a girl, which is exactly what's going on right now in our culture. They've got broken lenses and things that are so obvious they can't see. And I'm not saying they're bad people. I'm saying they're held captive by a worldview which is res resistant to the gospel. And I want to talk about how that happened. And then I want to talk about how we can overcome that because there's a simple, simple solution uh, the great thing is, is everybody in this room can participate in this. There are superstars in this room. There are priests in this room, men and women who are called to do um, unbelievably great things. There are also folks that are relatively ordinary who have been called to live extraordinarily ordinary lives. And you can do this too, powerfully. And so I want to talk about that. But what I want to see is that there's a, a set of influences that are going on in our world. And it's been going on for a long time. Dr. Sri led our leaders in the study of a book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self by Carl Truman. I don't have time to get into Truman's uh, study. He takes the argument back hundreds and hundreds of years and builds a compelling case that we've been wobbling for quite some time and now we're spiraling completely out of control. And in the last generation, it's just become undeniable that people are lost in a desperate sort of way. 
But I just want to pick up the last generation because I would argue that something's been going on in the last generation that was built upon the sand of the previous couple hundred years that Truman talks about that we're already, we were already thinking poorly or inaccurately about things. See, worldview is it's not what you think, it's, it's how you look at things. It's, it's a, I'll, I'll look at it this way. I'm an LSU fan. Whenever Alabama loses, it's good right off the bat. I don't have to think about it. It's just great. I just love when Alabama, my two favorite teams, LSU and whoever's playing Alabama. And I just, it's, I don't have to think about it. It's just right there. I'll give you another example. On the Feast of the Sacred Heart this year, the Dobbs ruling came back and Roe was overturned. Praise God. But there are millions of people in our country who immediately saw that as terrible news. They didn't think about it any more than you had to think that Roe being overturned was a good thing. Because there's all kinds of thoughts and, and views and convictions that you have that lead you to be pro-life. So yeah, we can learn the arguments, but we have deeply held convictions that are, are, are poured into us. And I want to talk about how that's happening and how I think it's happened in a particular way in the, the last generation. Now, I would go back and say, I think, when I talk about storytelling, I think, without a doubt, the greatest storytellers in the history of the world are our Jewish brothers and sisters and the Catholic Church. They've been telling stories for millennia. For many, many years, when those stories were being told, the person who told the story and the people who were listening did not know how to read. Stories were the lifeblood of the family. When the sun went down, you were done. Light a fire and tell stories. And so dad and mom would tell stories. And they would tell the stories of their ancestors and the great things and the terrible things that had happened. And this would become the framework for their life. And as Catholics, we tell the stories of the saints. But I would tell you that I think in the last generation, an entirely different set of stories have been told. And they're not from our background. We have the best story in the world. We are historically the best storytellers, but we've been out story told in the last generation. Marvel comic strip, 19 billion with a B dollars in storytelling and growing. These numbers are probably six months old. Star Wars, 22 and a half billion dollars. Harry Potter, 25 billion dollars. Game of Thrones, three billion dollars. In addition to that, you've got video games, $35 billion a year. Facebook, $86 billion. Twitter, $4 billion. Instagram, $7 billion. Pornography, $95 billion. Now, I'm not here to critique the stories much. There's a couple stories in here like porn and the Game of Thrones I would critique dramatically. But my point is, let's, let's take Harry Potter. I didn't have my kids read Harry Potter when they were young. Um, I, I actually had an argument with Archbishop Shapkew about this. He said, why won't you let your kids re read Harry Potter? I said, I don't have anything against Harry Potter. My kids don't know our story. And until they know our story, I don't want them to listen to somebody else's story. And it's the imbalance. See, here's what's wrong with these stories. There's two things that are radically wrong with these stories. The first thing is God is not in these stories. Oh, I know when you first saw the Star Wars, we, we as Catholics injected God. Well, Obi-Wan Kenobi is kind of a Christ figure. Okay, but, but you, you did that. They didn't do it. Harry Potter, there's, there's no Christ figure. And, and when we project that, these are, these are worlds in which God is not in, nor is he the center of the story. God is in and is the center of this story. Amen. The other thing that I would have against them, they're not true. I hate to break this to you, but Harry Potter never lived. Neither did Obi-Wan Kenobi. These things are all made up. And here's the problem. When young people read and watch this, and they don't know the biblical narrative. They don't know the lives of the saints. When they start to think about the most important things in life, they think about it from this perspective. That becomes the lens they're looking through. The world of Harry Potter the world of Game of Thrones. The author of Harry Potter said, I wanted to write a story about bad fathers. 
The author of Game of Thrones said, I wanted to write a story in which good lost and evil triumphed. These are good stories. I'm not saying they can't be entertaining, but if we don't know our story first, then we're going to be susceptible to thinking about the world. And so a young person today, when they think about the most important things from the perspective of these stories, without God at the center, that aren't true, when they think about that and they're confronted with real-life issues like death, they don't know what to do. If you ask a young person today, if you knew you were going to die in an hour, what would you do? Young people today would say, I'd find the prettiest girl I could find and I'd make love to her. To which we would say, really? You're going to die and meet God in an hour? So your, your plan is to commit mortal sin? That's the craziest thing you could possibly do. But Hollywood doesn't understand death or sex. And they've been teaching our young people not to know about death or sex at all. And these are two of the most important things in life. To be able to understand this, to be able to see these huge forces are coming at us. They're, they're, they're powerful. They're backed by billions of dollars. They're taking millions of hours of our time and our energy, and they're not moving us towards a godly culture. I'm not saying that we say no, no to all these. Those are decisions you can make. What I am saying is, if we don't turn up the volume on our story, the great story of salvation history and the lives of the saints, which is salvation history being played out in the era of the church, if we don't know those stories, if our young people don't know those stories, they won't be able to evaluate things like Dobbs from a Christian perspective. Do you see what I see? Says the hymn at Christmas. And it's a good question. Do you see? Do I see what he sees? When Jesus sees a, a, a mother in an unplanned pregnancy, is it primarily about choice or primarily about life for Jesus? It's primarily about life. Do you see what he sees? Because we live in a world where they don't. And, and we're losing the battle. And, it, and we have to recognize that. And I would say the battle we're losing the most on the college campus is the issue about homosexuality and gender. I would say we've been making steady grounds for the 25 years I've been serving on college campus on the life matters. Young people today are more pro-life on college campus than they were 20 years ago. And it makes perfect sense. Many of them have brothers and sisters that aren't here because they were aborted. Many of them have had abortions, and it didn't make anything better. They don't believe what their parents or grandparents might have believed in the 60s, make love and not war, free love. They don't believe that because they know that sex isn't free. It's one of the most costly activities in our culture. Millions of babies in their lives defend that. The broken lives. We work with college men and women, and I will say I see it particularly in the young women that we work with. The devastation of giving themselves away physically to men who don't love them. And the, then the pursuit for more attention and more love. And it's like drinking salt water. It doesn't satisfy. It actually makes you crazy and it can kill you. Now, the men are experiencing the same thing, but for some reason they, see, they seem to be a little more asymptomatic on the emotional side. Uh, but they're just as devastated. And to be able to recognize this. And so how do we rescue them? Now we're not talking about Ephesus we're talking about our, our young people, our, our sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters in high school and in college today. What are we going to do? Well, I think we have to recognize there's some good, good news here. The first thing is there's massive hunger. Do you know how much hunger you have to spend that many billions of dollars? Oh, my goodness, our young people are searching really intensely. And that's good news. Because we do have a true, the true story, and it is the best story, and God is at the center. We just have to learn how to tell it better and tell it more often. And that's what I love about Scott and Kimberly and their life, the Institute of Applied Biblical Studies, the St. Paul Center. This is what they have dedicated their life to. I knew the scriptures before I met Scott and Kimberly. I had read them many times, cover to cover. I just didn't know how to understand them. And you need that. I mean, when you think about it, when you look at our Protestant brothers and sisters and, and the Catholic understanding of, for example, John chapter 6, we gr agree 100% what Jesus said. We do not agree on what he meant. And how are you possibly going to know what he meant without somebody able to teach you? In, in some ways, that's exactly what the Ethiopian eunuch was doing in the book of Acts, reading the book of Isaiah. Philip comes up to him and says, do you understand what you're reading? He goes, how am I going to understand unless somebody explains it to me? And that's what the church can do. 
she can teach us how to understand. Not just what it says, but what it means. And that changed everything. Because once we learn how to read the Bible from the heart of the church, well, now all of a sudden we can become students of the greatest teachings and narratives in the world. Now, I want to say, I want to take a moment and talk about your mental capacity. I don't care if you're a genius or you think you're average or you think you're below average. You have so much more capacity than you could possibly imagine. Now, what, what you probably don't have is the capacity Scott Hahn has. I, I, I studied here, and in my last semester, I, I was so foolish. I decided to do an independent study with Scott. Scott likes to use the term drinking out of a fire hydrant. Uh, there was no place to hide for an entire semester. Uh, and he's just piling books on me. And, and, and he, he reads, and he's got a, a near or actual photographic, it's ridiculous how great his memory is. And, and I had childhood dyslexia. My, my retention's pretty good, but I read really slowly. And he's like, okay, a thousand pages a day. I'm like, how about a thousand pages a year? And I, at one point in time in this, this independent study, he handed me this 450 page book. And I'm, I felt like my eyes were bleeding. I, I'm reading them, oh gosh. And there's, it's the worst book I've ever read in my life. So there's nothing here. Blah, blah. It's going on and on. And I, I finally walked back over and I said, why did you do this to me? And he goes, oh, and he opens it up to page 342. And he goes, see that sentence? That's awesome. <laughs> Xerox the page, man. What are you doing? <laughs> Ridiculous. But I forgive you. Yeah, and I survived, barely. I didn't need glasses before that independent study. I do now. But I, I would challenge you, any, any of you who know young people, they know all the words to most of their songs on their playlist. And they know some of the words to all the songs on their playlist. I'm talking tens of thousands of lyrics and they've never seen the lyrics in writing. Our capacity to learn is amazing. We're just using it to learn the wrong stuff. Pop music, have you, have you read the lyrics? They don't even, if they talk about anything, it's bad stuff, usually it's nonsense. And to be able to recognize, and this is what they've committed, they've loaded their brain with this. And to the degree that it's not coming from a godly perspective, and all you need to do is watch next year's Grammy Awards to see how uh, how wholesome the music industry is right now. That's in them. And there was a principle they developed when they were creating the first computer, garbage in, garbage out. And our young people have been saturated and they watch video games. Our, our young people are, are supposed to be amazing. At his first mass, as Pope, Pope Benedict XVI said, and to you, you young people, the world offers you comfort, but you were not made for comfort. You were made for greatness. But our young people today experience greatness with their thumbs. I conquered a city today. No, no, you were really supposed to go conquer a city. You were supposed to bring Christ to, oh, no, I'm tired. My thumbs hurt. They, they've lost the, the, the desire for greatness because they have a counterfeit that makes them feel great in, a, in a, an imaginary world. I talked to young People, young men in particular, and I'll say, why don't you quit, become a missionary? And I'll say, well, I don't know if I'm called. I said, there's a huge need. I think you're called, unless you're called to something else. But a lot of these guys are like, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I'm like, I, I think you should do it. And it's, well, you know, maybe later, but I'm not hurting anybody. If you're a fireman and the alarm goes off and you're playing video games, you are hurting somebody. And God did not make our young people for comfort. He made them for greatness. And there's a big war going on out there. And here's the cool thing about it. We don't go out and kill for Christ, but we may have to die for him. We go out and love for Christ, but it's still war. The battle will be between the devil and ourselves, overcoming our own weaknesses so that we can love other people. That's the love that John and Mary and Paul poured into Ephesus. And it transformed the, the, the city and the region for centuries. That's the kind of energy that's needed today. And so my proposal is a... The little way. And what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about the road to Emmaus. I know you're familiar with it since you heard about it last night. <laughs> Just 
No, but what I, what I was talking with Scott about this is um, it's a funny thing to be a Catholic because we know the Bible so, so well, but we, but we don't know how to read it very well. It's been read to us. But if, if I were to start a story and say there was a, a man, a rich man who had two sons, and the younger son came to him and said, I want my share of the estate, you know how the story ends. Everybody in this room knows how the story ends. And, and now, not all of us know that it's in Luke chapter 15. But oh my goodness, telling you that it's in Luke chapter 15 is the easiest part. The hardest part was learning the story. And you already know, and you know many, many, many stories. Now, we don't always know. We, we know, for example, that Moses parted the Red Sea and that David killed Goliath. We may not be quite sure which one happened first. <laughs> and the cool thing about the way Scott is teaching is that it's, the Bible's filled with stories, but the Bible is a story. There's not just hundreds of narratives, and they're amazing, but there's a meta-narrative that connects Genesis to Jesus and to be able to see the power that's in this. Tim Gray and I uh, wrote a book together on virtue, and at one point in time, the FBI was using, it's a Bible study, and the FBI was using our Bible study to train FBI agents. And we were talking to the trainer, and he goes, here's what I do. I sit back and say, I don't, you don't need to believe that King David ever existed, but I want to tell you the story about King David and Bathsheba and Uriah because this is a great story. Because I don't need you to be believers, but I do need you to be virtuous. These stories are powerful, and they're true. David did exist. And to be able to see the power of these, and to be able to then recognize how they link together and build upon one another, and all of its points to a universal family of God that can radiate and re the love of Christ and receive converts into her heart. But at no point in time in the history of Christianity have even half the people on earth believed in Jesus Christ. The theme of our conference is found in Luke chapter 4. And also, you see my glasses? You see that? This never happens in Colorado. I can't see. Wait. It's humid here. Luke chapter 4. Jesus is in the synagogue. You know this. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, verse 18, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set those who are downtrodden free. Now, I don't... There, there's four statements there, and three of them, to me, make perfect sense. If I was blind and it was going to be the Jubilee, what would I want? I want my sight. If I was a captive and it was the Jubilee, what would I want? I'd want to be let, let, yeah, absolutely. And if I was downtrodden, I'd want to be lifted up. But it's interesting, he says, but to the poor, we'll preach the gospel. See, if it, was a, if it matched, it would be the poor would get wealthy. And, and, and they are getting wealthy. That's what the gospel does. But not the way we've been doing it. There's, a, there's a, something I think we just have to understand. I'm not here to criticize anybody. But we have to understand, John Carroll, the first bishop of the United States, I'm sure for good reasons, I'm, I don't know the man, obviously, I'm, I, know, I look old, but I'm not that old, the, uh, he removed missiology, the study of mission, from the curriculum because the United States was a melting pot and we were trying to get along. Now, he didn't say it was wrong or bad, he just said in the limited time we can teach, we're not going to teach this. And so the Catholic Church in the United States has never been a missionary church, and when we have been, it's been feeding the poor, not preaching the gospel to the poor, which is not what Jesus said. Now, I'm not opposed to giving food to the poor. Please, God, let's give food to the poor. But here's the deal. The corporal works of mercy serve the body, and they're limited because the body's limited. If I give you a, a meal, you'll be hungry tomorrow. But if I, could, if I could give you the gospel, you could live forever. And so we will care for the poor and their material needs. But much, much more important are the spiritual works of mercy. And we've reduced mission, for the most part, to the corporal works of mercy. And I think that's got to change. Without reducing the corporal works of mercy at all, we need the spiritual works of mercy to come back because the good news is going to be preached to the poor. And my experience is the poor are really receptive to it. And they're waiting for us. There are people in, in our culture, in our world, in different cultures, who are waiting and waiting and waiting. You know, I, we send mission trips. I think we've become the largest mission sending organization in the United States. 
and maybe in the world, I don't know. And we send thousands of people into first, second, and third world missions, United States, uh, Appalachia. One of our favorite trips is India. And uh, so a group of our, our folks was, was in India, and one of the mission trip leaders had been on multiple mission trips, but always to Latin America. And so he's, they're in India, and they're out just near Calcutta, and there's a little girl sitting in the sweltering heat, emaciated, covered in open wounds, and people are just walking by her. And a couple of the students that were on our mission trip said, I'm a nursing student. Let's just go get some first aid and get her some water. And, and we couldn't speak the language, and she was like an injured animal, and it took a, quite a while to just gain her trust so that we could give her some water. And then, of course, with the ointment and the bandages, they heard it first, and so she didn't understand what was going on, and, and so it was difficult. But over time, over hours, we started to gain her trust. But the other thing that was really amazing is that people started to gather. Hundreds. And finally, at one point in time, one of the, the locals looked at one of our missionaries and said, what are you doing? And we said, we're trying to help her. And he said, why would you do that? She was obviously terrible in a previous life. And she has to work it out. And if you don't let karma take its, take its role, she'll have to come back in a miserable life again. As Catholics, we don't believe in reincarnation or in karma. Now, if it's true, then maybe they're right. But that little girl's trapped. And if we're right, she needs to be rescued. And it's going to only be from a Christian perspective. And I would argue will only be done most perfectly from a Catholic Christian perspective. We can't think, that, and I'm not here to criticize the Hindus and the Buddhists that are there. That's not my point. I'm here to say that there are amazingly wonderful people who are trapped in false belief systems, waiting to be rescued. That's what the early apostles did. They rescued people from paganism because they were killing their children. And now we live in a neo-pagan culture and we're killing our children again. They need to be rescued. They're not bad people. They're victims. They've been held captive by the devil. And they're doing bad things. But they want more. They want you and they want me. So the road to Emmaus, Luke 24. So you know the story. It's Easter Sunday, not any Easter Sunday, the Easter Sunday. Jesus rose earlier in the morning. Uh, the two disciples, Clopas and his companion, uh, are, are walking and Jesus shows up and they don't recognize him. And he begins walking with them. And, you know, as Scott mentioned earlier, it, it probably was a couple hours, maybe a few hours. It's a, it's a six, seven mile walk. And uh, so they're walking along and they're talking, so they're probably not making great pace. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes up and essentially what he says is, uh, what's going on? And they're taken aback. <laughs> what do you mean what's going on? You're on the road from Jerusalem. You have to have known what just happened this weekend. What happened? Jesus, we thought he was the Messiah. And on Friday, they killed him. And now his body's missing. I go, <laughs> How do you not know this? And I, I imagine that as they walked, he was like, so, so tell me about this Jesus. And, and when the first one started, and said something like this. Oh, I, I was at this sermon that he gave on a mountain. It was crazy. I, uh, I quit my job, actually, and just started following him. It was, I was like, this is the guy. This is the guy. And uh, how about you? Oh, I was down in Jerusalem, and there was this woman caught in adultery. And uh, he walked up, and he, and he said, well, he was out sin, cast the first stone, and beginning with the oldest and wisest of the rabbis, they all dropped, dropped their stones. And then Jesus looked at her and said, but I don't condemn you either. Go away and sin no more. And I, I thought, gosh, if he could forgive sins like that, oh, he could forgive me. So I started following. That's great. What was your favorite part about Jesus? This goes on for a while. And, and, and then he's talking to him. And then finally he can't take it anymore. And he says, Oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses, that's the title of my talk, beginning with Moses, thanks, and, uh, and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all of the scriptures. <laughs> this is the best Bible study in the history of the world, better than Scott's. It's really, really good. It's, it's crazy how good this is, and, and Luke does not write one word about what he said. Not one word. Oh my, 
I don't know if you, you, if you go forward one page in John chapter 1, we find out what time it is. It's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Are you kidding me? Who cares what time it was? I want to know a little bit about the Bible study. But the Bible study is so good. It's so awesome. So he's there in the Bible study, and then he's, he's looking like they've reached the end, and he's going to go on. And it says, they urged him to stay with us. Because when you share the narrative of salvation history, well, people will want you to stay with them. It's compelling. Their hearts were burning. And then you know he goes into the end. He goes with them. And then the unity of the scriptures and the sacraments, they recognize him in the breaking of the bread, and then bam, he's gone. And so they, they run back to Jerusalem. Now, what I hadn't seen until recently, because the church, when she reads these to us, stops the story there on Sunday, and we pick up the next week. But literally in Luke's gospel, right back to back, the next thing we know is Jesus goes and appears in the upper room to the ten. You said 11 last night, it's 10. Judas was gone and Thomas was missing. I never, yes, so cool. That has never happened and it probably will never happen again. I almost told him about it privately earlier, I had no way. Um, and this, what does he do? He does the exact same thing. He gives the same scripture Teaching again, best Bible study in the world, number two. Not a different one, second rendition of the same story. And what we know from John's gospel, it's not clear in Luke's gospel, but just as in the first telling, the telling of the scriptures and the narrative were linked with the Eucharist, John helps to inform us that in the second telling, it's united with confession. Because in John chapter 20, we know in this meeting in the upper room, he gives them the power to forgive sins. We don't hear in John's gospel about the Bible study. So we have to piece these together and recognize. But the scriptures and the sacraments are meant to go so closely together. There's only one prayer that we all have to pray as Catholics. It's the Mass. There's only one book that needs to be read at every Mass, and that's the Bible. And that is true of all of the full forms of the sacraments. In an emergency, you don't have to read from the scriptures. Grab some water and baptize them. But in a, in a liturgical baptism, we read from the scriptures. The scriptures and the sacraments are meant to go close and next to one another. But my point, I think, is this. Jesus could have said anything. He could have done anything. But I, I got to believe he's like, you know, I've been waiting since Genesis 3 <laughs> to come and do what I just did. I, I just, well, first of all, my dad and I, the Holy Spirit, we wrote the Old Testament, loaded all kinds of stuff in there that you would never understand until I came and fulfilled it. That was amazing, so let me tell you that. But I don't know if you know, today, this morning, I destroyed the devil. It was awesome. It's, I, I had a really good day, and so did you. Best day ever. It's so cool. And the way I'm going to celebrate it, I'm going to, give, I'm going to share the scriptures, and I'm going to share the sacraments with you. Not to share the sacraments, but for confession, for the first time ever. And what he's doing is he's shaping their worldview to understand because crazy stuff happens. It had been a bad week. They were all confused, devastated. And now all of a sudden, his resurrection, as, and he can do this in your life too. I know there are people tonight that are hurting, devastating hurt, like I wasn't going to come because I'm in so much pain. And you chose to come. I am telling you, I don't know what is the challenge that you're dealing with. And I'm sorry you are, but I tell you our God is bigger than your problem. And to be able to recognize that is, that is salvation history. Salvation history says it's not that Moses is going to walk out and say, come on, Israelites, let's walk across the newly made bridge across the Red Sea. No, he brings them to the edge of the Red Sea, and then the most powerful military in the world is turned on them. Yeah, I mean, there are times I don't understand church leadership today. That would have been really hard to understand. Moses, really? Are you, are you crazy? Are you just trying to kill all of us? And then all of a sudden, poop, part the Red Sea. That's pretty cool. Nothing cooler than dead in the grave, rose from the dead. And not just rose from the dead, because Lazarus rose from the dead, but died again. When Jesus rises from the dead, he reveals the, revel the, the, the resurrection. This is not a resuscitation. No, Jesus' body can walk through walls. He can be in more than one place at a time. He can do anything you want. He can't suffer. And your body won't be able to either. It'll be able to do all those things and not suffer when you experience the resurrection. 
in Jesus. And that will be the case for everybody else who encounters the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we live in a world where people's lenses don't have room for God. Now, how do we fix that? How do we fix that? We tell them stories. That's how they got there. Just tell them better stories. And they're right here in the scriptures and in the lives of the saints. Tell them stories. An amazing thing happens. You know that's true for you, that I, I kind of watch, I, I like to watch movies because I like to forget when I'm no longer aware that I'm watching. Because at a certain point in time, you're like, okay, there's the credits, yeah. And then at a certain point in time, I'm like, wow, I was just totally there. And somewhere along the line, they just had me. And when the, when the narrative of salvation history is shared well, you will just have them. So my encouragement to you, learn the narrative well. You have immense capacity to do this. You already have so much. In some ways, some of the work at this point in time in our lives is just connecting the dots that are already there so that we can tell the story better. And then finally, I want to encourage you to actually tell the story. I was with Christian Smith. He works at Notre Dame. He's a sociologist. We were at a meeting with some bishops over evangelization, and Christian said, uh, oh, Curtis, I, you'll be interested in my new work. Uh, I, I researched and, and we studied hundreds of families. We broke them into three groups, Catholic, Jews, Hindus, people of faith, and then uh, and all of them people of faith. And the question was, did your kids practice the faith? And one group was all of them yes, the other group all of them no, and then in the middle, some yes, some no. And he said, we discounted the middle because we needed clarity, and we went and talked to those families who had either succeeded in every case or had failed in every case. And he said, Curtis, one thing came to the top more than anything else. Lots of things were important, meals together, going to church, all important. But he said the one, number one thing that, that made a bigger difference in helping young people to keep the faith of their parents, oh, I can see I'm out of time. I wish I could share it with you. Uh oh, oh you, I actually have a minute and 50 seconds left. Uh, he said they had spiritual conversations with their, with their children. What are spiritual conversations? They're stories. Let me tell you what I think about when I think about David and Bathsheba. Let me tell you what I think about, Mary did this today. Let me tell you about Joseph, the patriarch. Because he's one of the most glorious people in all of scripture. And we should think and talk about that. It'll captivate the hearts. These are men and women who either made the heroic decision to pursue virtue and were blessed or made the unfortunate decision of falling into vice and had to suffer consequences. And when you learn about that in a story, you can actually make better decisions yourself. When I heard about St. Maximilian Colby trapped in a concentration camp, I'd never heard about him before, so this is a, a, obviously a life of a saint, and 10 prisoners are lined up, they're gonna be executed, and one of the men said, please don't, I have a family. And Colby, Catholic priest said, take me instead. <laughs> that really happened? Yeah, he outlived all of them. In fact, he was living without food or water for so long, they finally went in and murdered him uh, because he just wasn't dying. And he was glowing in the dark the, the last part of his life, and the, and the guards were starting to convert, so they had to kill him. It was a terrible afternoon for him, but it's been great ever since. And there are hardships in our lives today, and they're terrible. Some of them are horrible. But they're only going to last for a fleeting moment, and eternity is forever. And so it is my hope and prayer for each of us that you will recommit and work with St. Paul Center to deepen our knowledge of the narrative and then love people enough to share the stories in spiritual conversations. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Father God, we want you to transform our minds and our hearts. We want you to launch the world, launch us into the world so we can evangelize the world, make the church strong and alive again so there will be light to the darkness and that many multitudes of people will come so that this generation of Catholics will serve this generation of people. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.